When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, our west coast became a potential combat zone. We know of new methods of attack. The fifth column. Military authorities therefore determined that all of them would have to murder 9066. The Japanese American concentration camp experience. No one knew our story. Keep up that fight. And we'll continue to win. People were not sure what would be happening after the war. That is why the commanding general of the Western Defense Command determined that all Japanese within the coastal area should move inland. We knew that some among them were potentially dangerous. Illnesses, the killings, families separated, you know, a property stolen. I think people were afraid to speak. My grandfather was picked up by the FBI on February 19th, 1942, the day the executive order was put out. Where he was from, Santa Maria, there were about 250 or 260 first generation people that were picked up, mostly men. And so it sort of devastated the whole community and, and, and immobilized them. I think people were afraid to speak. People were also not sure what would be happening after the war. So that kind of fear, I think, restrained people from protesting as much as they might otherwise have done. I think the, the impact on the community was, was so major. When I grew up, Japanese Americans were known as the silent American and nobody spoke up and you know, our parents told us to keep a low profile you know, because of the whole camp experience. And what I've been finding out, that there's a lot of examples of people speaking up. The first generation spoke up, they fought the alien land law, and African Americans supported them in their newspapers, the California Eagle, for example. And then, you know, later on, in, uh, at, during the war, there were many people that spoke out against the camps that supported Japanese Americans and people that were trying to challenge it, even in our own community, right? So people think, oh, our community was always quiet. We weren't. Yes, the camps had a chilling effect, so a lot of people didn't want to stand out, didn't want to cause any trouble, you know, just to, to do what you're told, you know, not create waves, etc. The history tells us something different. My family did not talk about the camps. And I think that we're still sort of uncovering that impact that passes on from, you know, one generation to the other. There were two bills, one to provide immediate a monetary restitution and one to establish a commission on wartime relocation and internment of civilians. Of course, we wanted direct monetary payments now, but we pushed and lobbied each commissioner that these hearings should be held in every city with a significant Japanese American population, rather just in Washington, D.C., where you'd have maybe a bunch of legislators and academics. So we had hearings in 10 cities, and those hearings changed my life. Um, my brother, as in regards to my brother James, was killed in Manzana. I have never been able to talk about this. More people have come up to me and said, I, sh I must speak up. My, my children, even my own children, don't know that my brother was shot in the bank. Seeing our people stand up and tell their story, story after story of, you know, the, the illnesses, the, the, the killings that happened in camp, the, you know, families separated, you know, a property stolen. It just created a bond between us. Every, everybody, it was, it was like we were trying to breathe support, you know, for every person that was speaking. There was so much unity in the community from those testimonies and those stories. And it's like every time I hear that, I hear any of them, I keep hearing something new. It is our history as a community. It was Nisei and Issei breaking a 40-year silence. The truth was that the government we trusted, the country we loved, the nation to which we had pledged loyalty had betrayed us, had turned against us. It enabled our community to see that we have a shared history of you know, oppression and racism in this country. I have a dream. 
seeing other communities that were oppressed stand up and speak up really energized us for the struggle for Japanese American reparations. We began marching against the war with other organizations, you know, marching to free political prisoners, you know, women's liberation. We know that the, the hardships and the, the, the racism that our, our grandparents went through coming here. And we didn't want to see the same things being imposed on new immigrants coming here. When 9-11 happened, it was Japanese Americans that were among the first to come out and protest the racial profiling of Muslims. And a lot of the fight for Asian American studies was done alongside other communities, you know, fighting for Chicano studies, black studies, Indian American studies, so it was all third world unity. You know, everybody takes for granted Asian American and, and ethnic studies, but when you look back at the third world liberation struggle at Berkeley for ethnic studies, you see that people spilled blood and there was even a death. Everything we have today was fought for and blood was spilled over, and I think it's really important to remember that and honor that. I think another thing that we need to worry about is the narrative. During the 80s, you know, when we were struggling for redress and reparations, no one knew our story. And it was the storytelling and the narratives and the testimonies of the people and actually having it on live TV that really put a human face on the Japanese American concentration camp experience and enabled people to really know the truth behind the camps. Most of us didn't even know about camps. Like one of my friends, Alan Nishio, said he always thought they were talking about summer camp when they talked about camps. People need to know who they are. We really share a lot in common with other communities, what we've gone through in this country, the things that we've suffered, different degrees, different times, but it all comes from the same thing. You know, it's, it's basically racism. In the United States, we're still struggling with a freedom of speech, you know, like with a critical race theory, and people try to use us, like with the recent um, Supreme Court decision on affirmative action, they had to use an Asian organization, you know, and that does not represent the majority of AAPIs in the United States. I think that it's really important for us to really try to control the narrative, put the narrative out there. No payment can make up for those lost years. So what is most important in this bill has less to do with property than with honor. For here, we admit a wrong. Here, we reaffirm our commitment as a nation to equal justice under the law. We need to look at our victory in, in terms of redress and reparations. It's a step towards a continuing struggle for justice in this country. I'm at a point where I know that there's not a lot of years left. And so it's the young people that really are going to be shaping what happens in this country. It's also for, I think, young people to speak out in terms of their own relating to issues like the model minority or, you know, anti-Asian hate, you know, things that people feel but are hesitant to speak about. It's your generation that's really going to be, you know, continuing the, the struggle for justice, the struggle for equality. I. Um, really have so much hope in the younger generation and want to work more closely together. In 2019, Japanese Americans joined with Sudu for Solidarity to go to Fort Sills, Oklahoma to block the detention of 1,400 children seeking asylum at the very site where Issei and Nisei were imprisoned during World War II. And people throughout the country folded 125,000 origami cranes, or tsudu, um, which were hung up as a symbol of hope and resistance, and that these mass protests forced the plans for the opening of the fort to be revoked. When that victory happened, I was just so inspired and I wrote this poem. A young crane lost, soaring, seeking, searching for familial sounds, the tsuru tsuru of graceful wings fluttering through summer skies. Her outstretched wings have seen many days, many miles, searching for family. The young crane cries, 
Mama, Papa, where are you? Cry, little crane, cry. Wings beating, tsuru, tsuru. A hushed, brushing sound as she circles the camp. Barbed wire, silent barracks, dimly lit bulb, casting shadows on a small wooden table where deft fingers gently fold tsuru, tsuru for peace, for hope. Across oceans, clouds mushroom, then dissipate, revealing a young sadako, gentle fingers intently folding a thousand cranes, tsuru soldiers for peace, for hope, until her time runs out. Tsuru, tsuru, wings beating harder, her journey bringing reluctant witness to imprisonment, family separation, nuclear devastation. Now, 70 years across time, desert detention, grim guards, demean, defile, deaf to silent screams, whispered whimpers, children's chattel, innocence on ice. Threading her way through space and time, from camp to camp, woven in history, the young crane finds her family in the spirit of 125,000 tsuru, a convocation connecting, crafted in unison by hundreds of gentle fingers, by families born of the camps, rising in resistance across clouds of time. Tsuru, tsuru, tell your story. Tsuru for justice, Tsuru for solidarity.